This video is going to be on the way that I found to get the most effective use of glaze tests if you're doing a continuous blend between a few different glazes. So in this case I'm doing a three or well, five by three style test. So what I've got is all the chemistry is identical apart from the silicate and alumina levels um, and it's mapped out like it would be on the stole map where you've got a, a grid of um, five by three tiles with increasing silica and increasing alumina um, and it's a slightly skewed rectangle essentially um, but the chemistry of the glaze is otherwise the same and it's just how stiff it is because of silica or alumina or both and it's a really good test to see how a glaze is going to behave and pick where approximately you want the chemistry to land. Um, the thing with these is to do 15 glazes would be a really laborious test and to do 15 glazes at once would require a decent amount of glaze if you're going to dip them because each one needs approximately 50 grams worth of dry mix um, to be able to dip even in one of the tips the SteriFeed bottles, um, which I think these are great because if you throw your test tiles like I do, the test tiles fit perfectly. So I can, in 50ml of liquid, I can dip a whole test tile. Um, these have got texture on them, they've got slip, black slip on the reverse, they've got um, a burnished rim like my pots would. So these are a good test to see how a glaze will behave on one of my actual pieces. Uh, yeah, the wall thickness is comparable. So they're a good test and dipping is how I would use the glaze. So um, this is a good way of mimicking the glaze behavior. The problem is to do 15 tests at once. Um, either takes a lot, well, it takes a lot of time and takes a lot of glaze. Um, what I'm gonna show you now is the way that I do it, where I'm only starting with, as I said, you need approximately 50 grams per, I mean, probably not quite 50 grams, but maybe 35, 40 grams of glaze mix per point that you're going to test. And I've mixed up the four corners. So I've got these four containers, which these are great as well, by the way. These are from Wilco. Um, they're soup beakers, so 400 mil, a uh, really good seal, and they're about a pound. Um, so I would recommend them if you're in the UK, but I haven't seen anything comparable online. So if you're in America, you probably can't get them. But I've got the four corners, so I'm going to do the corners, and then I'm going to blend to get every test between them, because if you're doing glaze tests and you're doing um, like a stole map, if you have the four corners, you can draw a line between them essentially, and anything within that box can be made by blending the four corners in different ratios. Um, but to do that manually all at once requires a lot of glaze. If you do it the way that I'm about to show you, it uses the glaze, it just basically moves it around so you can dip each tile without actually needing enough to, to dip them all at once. And the logic is essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my corners that be mapped out like so. So this would be my grid, increasing silica, increasing alumina. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip each of the corners, then I'm going to mix these two together to get that tile. I'm going to mix these two together to get that tile, these two together to get that tile, these two together to get that tile. I can then split each of the midpoints in half, so you won't be able to see it because that's in the way, but then I could get those two tiles by putting half of that and half of those. Let's do the same up there. And then if I pour these two together, these two together, those two together, I've got the full set of 15. Um, each time I've got a dippable amount, I'll fill one of these containers. But because I basically, I started with this tile filled, then I moved half of it to these ones. I only need to take another half a container from these. And then those two combine to get that one. And then these ones combine to get that one. At each time you're moving towards the center, adding the glaze together. So 
pretty much once you've poured those four halfway points, you don't need too much more from the corners. And you can do the same, the same logic works on a 25 grid, so five by five. Um, you have to change the sequence slightly, and I think it will work with other ones as well. But the idea is basically once you've dipped a tile, how do you then use what you've mixed up for that tile to get to the next one? And if you follow that logic heading from the outside into the center, because these you can combine these two to make this one but you can combine these two to make this one or you can combine these two to make this one or so on you can combine in different ways so that's the logic and i will just run through the whole thing um, start to finish and i want to the first thing i want to do is use an immersion blender to blend these because they are currently unmixed. I poured them in, let it sleep overnight, uh, but I have not mixed them up. And I am testing a glaze, a variation on a glaze that I called Blurple because I couldn't think of a better name, but it's a, a chrome tin purple with a little bit of cobalt in, and it's got a bit of bone ash in it, which gives it more opacity and more phase separation. And essentially the tile that I tested would have been around up here top row, kind of top full alumina, mid silica, essentially. So I've expanded it out to see what it's like when it's more translucent, more runny down here, more opaque over here, um, and that one's bordering on matte. So there should be some interesting tests, um, but it should be a phase separated uh, bluey purple, um, hopefully, should be interesting and because it's a chrome tin it's really important how you mix it i've done a post on these before but um this has titanium in it and it has tin in it and both of those are sensitive to how or can be the ingredients i've got are sensitive to how they are mixed so if i mix them up by hand and pass them through a 100 mesh sieve i will get a different glaze result to if I immersion blend them. And I believe that's because when the ingredients are made, they are produced to a higher mesh size. So they're a finer powder that then clumps together and doesn't want to break up. So putting it through a 100 mesh sieve, you'll break them up enough to pass them through the sieve, but you won't necessarily break them up further. Whereas the immersion blender is um, harsh enough that it completely mixes them. So I've got another video, I'll link that. Um, it shows how much difference it can make. If you just mix them up and don't pass them through a sieve, you almost get no color. And then as you immersion blend it, you'll get more and more color because the more you break it up, the more those elements are able to dissolve into the glaze, the more they're able to color it. So it can make a huge difference, not so much for some ingredients, more so for others in this particular one there are ingredients that need to be broken up and will behave differently if they are. So I need to immersion blend all of them because it's the same glaze, same colorants. There's very little chance of contamination. Um, I am just going to blend in sequence, starting with the lowest and working up, which means there will be a small amount of contamination because I'm not gonna clean between, but um, I don't think it matters because you're talking about maybe half a percent difference. So you'll see what I mean in a second. I'll, I'll speed this bit up because you won't be able to hear me talking over it anyway. Right, that took longer than I was intending, but that part is done. So now is the part that is actually relevant for this video. What I want is my 0.01 gram scale. So this is one of the ones that weighs a small amount more precisely. Um, no, don't want to do that. And what I'm gonna do is I pick out 
15 test tiles that are approximately, and I'm going to, I'm going to start in future cutting them more consistently than I do at the moment. Put the tile on the scales and zero it before I put the glaze on and then I know how much glaze I've added and that's glaze and water but I weighed the water so I know how much um, glaze I've added and I can work backwards. In this case it's 100 grams base mix for 100 grams water so it's a very easy calculation. Um, but what it means is that I can put a comparable amount of glaze on each test tile. Um, it doesn't really matter how much so long as I know that each tile is pretty similar um, and therefore when I see the results I'll know that they're basically the same. Um, if you don't do that, particularly with a stole map, um, what you'll get is the glazes with more um, alumina in them have more kaolin, more, more clay, um, they will behave differently to the glazes with basically none in um, so dip times might not be exactly the same and if all you do is dip for four seconds or whatever you won't know necessarily what the cause of that difference is whereas if you weigh it you you have a fairly good idea um, why is that one different? right so we'll start with this one and what I've done for convenience is I've gone A, B, C, D for the corners and I'm going to call them, you know, kind of some reference. It'll be um, A, 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 B, A, B, A, B, 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 and so on and so forth. That's just my code for it, but um, makes it simpler. So, fill this up to approximately the bottom of the screw. And that dip gives me a weight of 4.6, which is about what I'd expect for a thick application on one of these tiles. So, good. And then I'm gonna use, reuse that as um, the in-between points, you don't have to wash them out. One thing with these cheap scales is they don't buttons go very soon. Four point three I will four point three five I'll go with that because it's a slightly narrower tile. And then what I was meaning is to save washing the things out, I will arrange them like that, so each one of these will have a tile that it's um, had one of the two places in, if that makes sense. So what I want to do is that one on and do 40 of the first glaze. First, oh, 40 of the first glaze. the second place. If you 
you wanted to do this in a more controlled way this is where syringes would be quite useful um, because obviously you can control the flow that much better than you can just pouring out of a big container but I don't care that much with all of these I'm just looking to get within a couple of percent of what I think they are if I'm ever so slightly out which I mean obviously there's going to be some weighing issues as well the scales give me an approximation and I go to approximately right for what the scales say um, so with all of these I don't work with any glazes that care enough that 1% out will ruin them if you're a crystalline potter or something like that you might want to be more precise but I don't need to be which is a nice luxury to have right so now we've got our midpoints you can see me filling in the grid over here but what you do is the same thing again so this is going to be a B because it's halfway along the top row Okay, so we have filled in those bits. Now, we can zero on an empty tile, no, empty container. That's got 74, so we're looking for 37 out. The logic here is just that you split the difference so you'd have there's 74, so you get um, 37 in each of them, which they should be pretty close. And yeah, I have stopped just short, and actually that one's just over, so we'll go over. So that's 37.3 um, and 37.4, fine. And then what you want to do is just double it to take it back up to 74 by adding this one in. So this is A. So that is now AAB because it's the halfway between A and AB. Now this is where having loads of these helps. What I can do so you take the top and the, essentially, <laughs> yeah, just the, the top and bottom of a column. In this case, it's the second column. I'm doing 40 grams of each.
and then you combine the two ends in this case but actually you could combine at this point there are plenty of combinations you could do because you're making the center one and the logic is all you need to do is combine equal amounts of two positions that are opposite each other on the grid so as you can kind of see how I've got it mapped out or you can't see it how I've got it mapped out over there um, you know what forget it <laughs> you can go diagonally and you can go across but um, in this case I'm going across So I've now got 15 tiles, each with comparable amounts of glaze on, um, with continuous blends, or rather stepped blends from the four corner points, and dipped each of them in that much glaze. But when you pull the amount of glaze that I actually used, um, it's far less than would have been needed to do them all at once and this is a relatively quick way of doing it obviously this is still a moderately slow process but this is the fastest way I have found of doing it without um, just get paying someone else to do it for you which would be lovely if I could get someone to do all the glaze testing like this and just give me the results um, I would be very tempted uh, there's a certain amount of satisfaction in doing it but most of the satisfaction is in having worthwhile results not this part of the process um, I don't know how much of that video I will actually have unsped up so hopefully um, it's not been too dull the total time recording time including all of the blending and sieving and preparing the glazes is about 45 minutes um, probably once you take that part out, it's down to maybe 20 minutes to do that many tests, which, yeah, isn't too bad. So this is a less wasteful way of being able to dip your test tiles. Obviously, if you wanted to brush them on, then you could mix just as much as you wanted. If you were using a, um, a curry grid, one of the, the clay uh, shapes where you've got the indents and you just mix them up and put them in the indents, that's a very efficient way of doing it. Um, it's not comparable to fired results in the same on a piece the same way these are where I can see how it looks over the rim I can see how it looks over texture I can see it's on a vertical surface and it's dipped which is how I would use it uh, but curry grids can be a very quick way of um, doing the same thing without having to mix up so much each time but if you want to dip it I highly recommend these little bottles if your test tiles fit in them or finding something that works uh, TC um, who's at Cone Infinity on Instagram has a demonstration of how he does his and he's got slip cast um, sort of like mini inverted beaker things that he uses as a test tile um, and it, because of the, the, the shape that they are and then he's got a corresponding plastic container he can put about that much glaze in the bottom and when he dips it goes more or less all the way up because of displacement these don't displace so much but um, I guess you could make a shape if you were slip casting them you could make a shape specific. the camera ran out of battery before I finished saying what I meant there which was that you could make test tiles specifically to displace most of the, the capacity in those SteriFeed bottles which would allow you to dip tiles with less um, if I was slip casting them I'd be quite tempted to try some form of shape that was round uh, and near the same dimensions as them and then I reckon you could get away with mixing up maybe 20 mil of glaze anyway that's a project for another day I've got my fired results they're actually there's less immediate variation than I was expecting given how far they move around the map but I think that is because the bone ash changes the way glazes behave and what it's doing is it's making them all behave fairly similarly. I'll put up a picture of um, how it looks without the bone ash um, and without the cobalt, but you get far more variation when you don't have the bone ash in it. And I think that's why. 
um, but you can kind of see if you put the two uh, <laughs> get them both on screen the variation there there's a lot more opacity in this bottom corner high silica low alumina um, compared to high alumina low silica and you can really see it on the the, the black reverse and this one's really quite opaque whereas this one's translucent and actually even more so where it's flowing on the low everything it goes quite um, transparent and you get far more movement so there is a degree of variation but they are all quite similar um, I'll sort them all around a bit. There. I personally from looking at these tiles prefer the upper corner I like the movement that you get down here upper um, individual images still images over the top of this so I like the amount of movement you're getting down in the bottom corner it keeps the color um, but I prefer the, the overall finish up in this corner um, where they're glossy and smooth whereas these are a bit more pitted and it's a nice solid but as in not it's a opaque not solid because the whole point of adding the bone ash is to get the phase separation to make it more mottled which these do still have um, it's not so obvious but um, there's when you really zoom in on them or you look closely you'll see there's a there's a texture to them which is preserved better in the top corner these tend to be a bit more blurry yeah so that that's basically how I would go about doing a test where I had four corners and I wanted the in-between stages but it would work just as well if you had colorants so what I'm considering doing now is picking one of these top recipes possibly even this top corner and I'll do a version where I have the, the tin and titanium tin and titanium and chrome tin titanium chrome and cobalt and tin titanium and cobalt so what you'll get is purple blue and then or rather red blue purple and you get incremental steps I, need, I want to change some variables, but not all of them. I think the titanium and the tin are necessary to give this glaze any sort of characteristics. So it will start with a very, very faint mottled pink down here, if I did that, um, and then increase those ways. So I might do that, but you could use it for anything you wanted. It doesn't have to be um, silica and alumina. Again, you have a different flux to so say you put calcium, strontium, and you, the, the problem would be that there would be some that you were missing if you had four different corners. Um, but in theory, if you had like calcium, strontium, and say you wanted to use magnesium and zinc, and what you'd do is you'd sub out, so that would be whiting, and then if that was going to be strontium, it'd be strontium carb. Magnesium, you'd use talc probably. You could use mag carb. I wouldn't recommend it. you go with talc. Uh, and then if that was going to be zinc, it'd be zinc oxide. And what you'd do is you'd adjust the recipe so that you could swap that ingredient out and keep all other things the same. And then you'd blend between them. And that is something I do want to do um, because one of my initial things is this is the purple is coming from the chrome tin red mixed with blue. The chrome tin won't form red unless it's got a calcium base. And part of the reason that recipes like June Perry are more interesting, especially when you do the June Perry, the purple with more chrome, and some people put a little bit of cobalt in it, you're ending up with this sort of effect. It's because the magnesium phase separates. So I've used um, bone ash to get uh, phosphorus to separate, but you can do that by using uh, Gertzi borate rather than uh, 3134, uh, because that's pure calcium and uh, jersey boric is calcium and magnesium so you get more phase separation because of that likewise you can do the same kind of thing where you use this base but rather than adding whiting you would add uh, talc and somewhere between pure calcium and only the addition of talc um, in place of the uh, whiting there'll be a really nice amount of phase separation 
and on my initial tests I found it was kind of getting interesting when it was probably of the um, alkaline earth fluxes if it was probably three quarters calcium and one quarter something else that's when you start getting enough phase separation to be interesting but not so much that it overpowers the purple anyway the problem with this is there are a dozen different directions i could take these tests and i don't have enough time to take all of them and do you know kind of even 15 tests per direction you end up it's just an obscene amount of work so i don't know which direction i'm going to go first probably pick one of these and do the colorants and maybe come back to the fluxes as a different test, a different day. But I'm kind of happy with the top corner. In fact, I'm happy with how all of them are working. They're all kind of interesting in their own separate way. Like this one, not the prettiest of glazes, but there's quite a nice, where it starts to break, if you can see it, it's breaking blue and then becoming purple. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that one would do it and other ones wouldn't. Like, I'm not sure what about the glaze being thin stops the chrome tin on a high alumina low silica one where it doesn't on a low alumina low silica one. Um, I don't know. Interesting to see that it does. And they're all viable glazes. It's only just starting to craze on that one. And the rest seem to be quite solid have applied quite well. They've all got a good flux ratio and pretty solid chemistry, uh, sensible colorant levels. So actually any one of these would do. I might stick all the recipes up if you want to have a play with them, but basically if you take them, whatever, so blurple at the moment would be, I think, this tile. So if you took that and just moved it around the map, you'd find your own one. Um, and then particularly if you wanted to go this way, all you'd do is decrease silica. But yeah, the main point of this video was not the resulting glaze, although it, I, still, you know, I, can't, I find this interesting, but the, the point of it was the process, which hopefully has been useful. But um, yeah, let me know if that all makes sense. And hopefully there's something there of use to you.